Good afternoon. During my sermon yesterday, I talked about how the angel Michael and his followers were able to defeat the dragon. Uh, the dragon, of course, is the devil, also known as Satan. Uh, we read about this in chapter 12 of the book of Revelation, and it really wasn't much of a contest. As we read about it there, the angels easily and quickly won their victory. What I didn't talk about yesterday, though, was how they won their victory, which is also how we win our victory over Satan or over the forces of evil and sin and wickedness in our lives today. So this victory happened in Revelation, and because this is Revelation, there's a song about it. I think Psalms may be the only book in the Bible that has more singing than Revelation. Revelation certainly has more singing than any other book in the New Testament. The song in chapter 12 is a celebration because of the salvation and power and kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. This is what they're singing about. And they sing because the accuser, by the way, that's what the name Satan means. Satan means the accuser. They celebrate because the accuser has been defeated. Uh, the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been hurled down, is the way it's actually worded. They, that is, our brothers and sisters in Christ, they triumphed over him. So the victory isn't just what Michael and his band of angels did. This victory is our victory over Satan, over his accusations, over against his evil, over against his temptation and deception and attempts to lead us astray. This is how we have our triumph as well. Now, we don't combat Satan and we don't defeat him with brute strength or with violence or with deception of our own. I mean, those are his weapons. We don't defeat Satan with clever words or with strength of will. Because to be honest, we're not clever enough and we're not strong enough to defeat Satan ourselves. Now, Satan may be no match for God and his angels. But Satan is a very real threat for us if we face him alone. But we don't. We have two weapons we can use, if you want to call them weapons. Uh, maybe it would be better to say we have two resources or two powers at work that win us victory. The first one is very obvious. Uh, if you're familiar at all with the Christian faith, it won't surprise you to hear that the greatest power we have in our uh, combating evil is the blood of the Lamb. The Lamb, of course, is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ won his victory over evil and sin and death through his blood, that is, through his atoning death on the cross. Now, there's a lot of ways to explain how Jesus won his victory on the cross, uh, or to word it in a different way. There's a lot of ways to describe what atonement means. I'm not going to take the time this afternoon to list all the different explanations of atonement, other than to say we need all of these different explanations because it's greater than what one simple explanation can um, explain for us. To put it most simply, Christ won his great victory over evil through his death on the cross. And that just doesn't seem to make sense, does it? because you would think that his death was his tragic defeat, when in fact it was the height of his triumph. And so as his blood, as his atoning death is at work for us, Satan doesn't stand a chance. But we have a second resource that we can use in our combat against Satan and the forces of evil. The song describes it as the word of their testimony. Now, as I'm going through Revelation this fall, I'm noticing something that I never really saw before in my study of this book. I'm noticing how often testimony and witness and the Word of God appears in this book. Not only does it appear, but it is a defining feature of our Christian life. Christians are people who testify, who bear witness. And as we do so, this is how Christ's power and authority comes forward in our lives. For example, when John described Jesus as he first saw him at the beginning of this vision, he talked about a sword coming out of his mouth. 
This is a way for us to understand the power of his words coming from his mouth. And throughout Revelation, people of faith are constantly being described by their witness. This, in fact, is how John even describes himself. In chapter 11, just before this story of Michael's defeat of Satan that I'm talking about, in chapter 11, we read about two witnesses, about God's agents who have come to earth on his behalf. They come to stand against wickedness and evil. These two agents that God sends into the world are not soldiers. They're not here with bulging muscles or fancy weapons. No, they are two witnesses. They come to testify to the truth. Their power is in their words. Over and over again in Revelation, we hear about the power of testimony and witness. So, what does that mean for us? As we struggle with sin and evil in our own lives, whether it's the sin that we commit or the sins of others that we endure, this is good for us to remember. To remember, first of all, that the victory has already been won through Christ's saving work. Christ has already won it. What we are doing is living the victory that he has won. But secondly, we have the power of testimony. It is through our words as we declare what God has done in our lives, what God has done in this world, as we declare the wonders of God, it is then that we find our true power. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, there are many times in this world when it seems as though evil is winning, when it seems as though the forces of sin and death will prevail. But we know, Lord, that these appearances truly are deceiving. We celebrate because you have already won the victory, the victory that is continuing to unfold in our lives. So give us, Lord, the boldness and the courage to testify, to speak to the victory that you have won, to bear witness to your lordship and your authority. And in doing so, Lord, may we not only bear witness to your name, but may we declare truth in the face of evil. Amen. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll talk again on Wednesday. Enjoy the rest of your day.